Good afternoon, SCTE Expo participants. Welcome to this immersive panel on the evolution of learning. You're in for a treat, I promise you. This is an interactive experience, which will include the ability for you all to engage in conversation with fellow learners and to ask questions of our dynamic and diverse panelists. Throughout this discussion, please use the chat window to submit your questions and we will address them in the second segment of this discussion. In just a moment, they will provide, all of our panelists will provide multiple perspectives on managing through change. Our esteemed panelists will share insights on how learning has had to evolve with COVID-19 and other events. You will get to meet each panelist in a moment. But first, let me give you a few pointers on what connects us. I am thrilled to let you know that all of us believe in the mission of cultivating talent. We are connected to companies that believe in investing in their greatest asset, their people. And lastly, but not least, we thrive in a dynamic, agile, highly change environment where technology and humanity converge. As Jerry Maguire said, you got me at hello. I am thrilled to call them colleagues and delighted to call them friends. But first, before we go right into it, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about our panelists. First, let me introduce you to Abby Odell. She has been with Charter Communications for over 18 years as a technical support representative initially, climbing her way up through the ranks and making a transition into training in 2008, where she oversaw training for a wide variety of departments, including direct sales and technical operations. During this time, as an innovator, she also started the virtual training team, specializing in providing engaging and interactive sessions for remote participants across the company's footprint. In 2016, she was promoted into the regional training manager over all field operations training for the Northwest region for Charter, which includes many different cities. She is currently the senior director of learning services for field operations, supporting the organization in the development of engaging and interactive learning experiences for our field operation team members. She holds a bachelor's from the University of Montana. And if that's not enough, Abby is currently pursuing a master of education from Colorado State University. Welcome, Abby. Our next panelist is Rob Wilk. And Rob is actually joining us from Nova Scotia, Canada today. He has been with the communications industry for over 17 years and has been in technical training for more than eight. Rob has a passion for finding new and innovative ways to better serve the operations group through training and quality programs. He's highly invested in developing his employees and using technology as a force for good. Welcome, Rob. Last but not least is Stacy Young Rivers, who is the Director of Technical Human Capital Management for the Technology Division at Warner Media, which is formerly Turner Broadcasting. In her role, Rivers is responsible for competency framework models, employee skills and assessment, and L&D strategies. Just last year, Rivers was selected as the Association for Talent Development one to watch. Watch out for this lady. Rivers serves on the Consumer Technology Association CTA Future Workforce Council, the Technology Association of Georgia Converge Committee for Diversity and Inclusion, and she is also climbing the educational ranks, currently pursuing her PhD in Educational Leadership at Mercer University in Atlanta. 
Her research focuses on massive open online courses, and she is exploring the perceptions of underrepresented students for careers in STEM. Rivers is also a graduate researcher in Mercer University's STEM Education Innovation Lab. She's also a mother and thrives on really learning and elevating the K-12, the K through 12 curriculum and agenda around learning. Welcome to all of you. So which transformations will be short-lived and which will be lasting? And in fact, what will the future hold? Shall we jump right into it, ladies and gentlemen? Yes, we shall. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, please let us know where you're listening from. We, we know and we appreciate that some of you are joining us internationally and you're joining us from all across the United States. So let us know where you're joining us from. In our keynote, we heard about the modern learner and the specific learning needs. So Abby, can you tell us how is your organization thinking about the modern learner and what approaches are you taking to address the needs of those modern learners? Yeah, thanks, Agnes, and, and thanks for having me. Um, I, I don't know about you guys, but I thought Anthony's talk was pretty insightful about not only where we're coming from as organizations, but also where our learners are coming from so we can meet them where they are, right? So for me, I think the biggest thing, um, when, I, when I think about the modern learner and what the needs of our learners are that we serve, it's really a, like a huge paradigm shift for training and what training meets, needs. And when you think about, you know, where people were coming from, coming to, for example, like, say, a, a new hire training class for technicians, you know, 20 years ago, there was a lot of focus on transferring knowledge into their brains, right? So giant three ring binders of information and a lot of memorization of stuff, because these are folks that were going out to work solo in the field. And their resource was their own ability to memorize stuff we were teaching them in class. And so that like the model of training was a lot different when, when you look back over time. But now we think about our modern learners and ourselves, you know, we all have the full might of the internet in our pockets, right? And for many of us, our organizations are giving mobile phones, internet connected mobile phones to our frontline field employees. So they have the ability to look that stuff up. So it's, it's less about that you know, memorization and recall model that we've used in the past and more about how do we teach people to search for resources and find them and then critically review them and know, is this a good resource? So like, think about yourself, you know, when you need to find an answer to something, you're not taking a course at a community college for changing brake pads on your car. You're getting on YouTube and you're watching a video. And it's the same thing for our folks. So we really need to pivot and think about how do we meet those learners where they are, understanding that the needs, uh, their needs have changed, their learning preferences and styles have changed, and just the whole environment in which they work is different. So one of the things that our organization has been doing is sort of changing into that self-directed learning mode where we are setting up learning experiences for our learners that are less about the instructor and more about the learner experience, where we design this, this engaging opportunity for them to dig in, find those resources, learn how to use them, sift through them, see what's really meaningful for them so that they can have those informal learning moments back on the job and be more effective at their work. So Agnes, I would really say in a nutshell, it's a lot about shifting where we are focusing as a training organization on the instructor or content into the learner and how we prepare them to really kind of chart their own path, you know, find it on their own. I love that, charting their own path and empowering them to really uh, go seek that knowledge. That is a fantastic way to do it. Um, Stacey, I know you had some thoughts on this as well. Uh, do you want to build on that? Thanks, Agnes. I would love to. And I really echo everything Abby just said. I think that we have to figure out how do we partner with the learner to provide them with what they need. And that's exactly what Abby described. People are learning on their own outside of the organization. And if you think about that, they're doing it already. So how do we then pull them into an engagement uh, environment that allows them to do the same thing that they do on their own time. And so I've created a model that 
is similar to what Abby described, but it's about how do I allow people to choose what they need to learn and provide those resources in a structured way that allows them to get what they need, explore, and also align with the business demands for skills development. And that really speaks strongly around the transformation that we have to embark on um, as organization to meet the needs of, of really future learning. Um, that ability to customize and allow people to learn in a social environment. I think Anthony said uh, between June and October, there was like a 600% increase in engagement in social learning, which speaks powerfully. Um, can you, Stacy, really tell us um, what some additional ways that learning organization must transform to meet the needs of, of future learning. And really, when we think about it more extensively, the future workforce it will support. I've been thinking about this and what I've come to realize is that I think there are three areas where we have an opportunity as learning leaders. First is competencies, second it's co-creation, and then third it's career mobility. And I'll explain what I mean by that. From a competency perspective, I think it's in the best interest of the company and employees to understand what is it that the company find value and the competencies based on the direction that the company is headed in and share that broadly. Because when you do that, you allow people to self-select what they want to expand on. The second part of that is the co-creation. And I think Abby and I did a great job of describing how do you provide resources in a way that allow people to figure out for themselves what it is that they need and how they want to consume it. So you've got to, you know, apply that in different ways. And then third, career mobility, I, that is really the next wave of what it is that we should be allowing people to do. Because the organization is changing fast in some respects, we want to be able to grow our employees with the organization as opposed to always going outside the organization to bring talent in. And the way to do that is to create a structure that will allow you to create an internal talent pool that people continue to uh, reinvigorate, reevaluate, and reinvent themselves to move with the organization. Oh. Agnes, you may be muted. Yep. So I, I thank you so much for that, Abby. I, I love those three uh, points that you you underscored being it the competency, the co-creation and the career mobility. Rob, I know at, at Eastlink, you have all do, been doing some amazing things that really connects with, with some of the, the things that Stacy just mentioned. Um, what exactly have you been able to do as an organization this year to accelerate your transformation? Um, I know you are already on that journey, but there was some serious acceleration that occurred um, can you share that with with uh, the, the audience? Well, I guess in the last little while to to sort of play off a bit of what Abby had said earlier, I mean, it's how important it is that, you know, of course, now we have uh, we have our companies providing us uh, cell phones where uh, information and training is easily accessible. Uh, but, you know, I, I think, you know, we we've done a good job over the last little while of uh, providing a true uh, mobile workstation uh, and giving the 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 learner the ability to deliver or to to train uh, in a truly mobile platform. So uh, you know, in addition to schedule training, allowing the learner to consume the content when and where they can, it's uh, vital to engagement. I think. Um, and also uh, providing learning in an information that's it's instantly accessible at any time, anywhere, uh, in easily digestible um, time and uh, easily digestible within time limited time frames. Of course, uh, uh, I've said it before, where you know uh, most of our technicians are up against the the quota monster, and. Uh, uh, having the ability to train when and where they can uh, is is key to it, to engagement and success. I think. I think I'm going to use that the quota monster. <laughs> I love it. The quota monster. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So so this disruption that we experienced as a world, as uh, employees within companies, as students, really was 
um, just astronomical this year and really unprecedented. Um, the, the pandemic itself disrupted more than, I, I think, 1 billion learners across um, kindergarten to 12th grade, even in higher education and, and around professional learning, um, forcing them to stay at home. And, and we all experienced, some of us actually were, were a part of that, overnight went uh, from being in buildings and in-person learning to online learning, which has now really become the norm. And, and a lot of organizations, I know my organization, Cox, uh, scrambled in lightning speed to really adapt. Um, so in what ways are you accelerating your digital transformation? And perhaps you could spend a little bit time telling us about whether or not you're, you're leveraging technology such as AR or AI, um, different tools and systems to really um, accelerate that process. And maybe Abby, we could start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I actually wanna harken back to, if, if any of you had the opportunity to see the awesome CEO kickoff on Monday, one of the things that Dave Watson from Comcast said, um, which really struck me was, our industry doesn't question what's possible, we make it possible. And that just really hit me because I feel like it is a perfect encapsulation of exactly what you were just talking about, Agnes, how as a, a learning industry, not just adult learning uh, that we're in, but the, you know, the K through 12 system and the college systems had to just very quickly pivot. And it wasn't a matter of, can we do this? It's how do we do this? And I think that's one of the things that I'm most proud of about our organization, all of our organizations collectively, not just charter, is that we really just started doing the same things we wanted to do all along, but we did it faster. So it was, we, we pressed the gas, we just made it happen. And I think um, Rob hit on a couple of really cool points about mobile learning. And uh, that's one of the things that in our organization, we have really amped that up. So it's not to say that, you know, like all of you, we weren't doing that before, but it's like, oh, holy mackerel, we need to do this a lot faster and in a bigger volume, and we need to push this stuff out really fast. So one of the things specifically that we did very early on um, back in March is we transitioned to um, a new or a relatively new platform for publishing documentation and some of our video content that we can put out there um, outside of our LMS. And we were able to very quickly roll out some content like video content um, specifically to be able to help keep our folks in the field safe. Because while some folks have been able to, you know, have the opportunity to work from home or work remotely, in our industry, we have folks who are out there on the streets, like going into people's houses. And we need to make sure that we are serving that group of our teammates and giving them the support that they need, most especially right now. So I think the biggest thing that I would speak to that I think all of us have done is transitioning to more effective um, mobile deployment of content that is really truly scalable and mobile friendly and moving to those short like bite size like Rob spoke to, you know, little chunks where people can quickly find that information back to that informal learning model where it's like, oh, how do I quickly see a video on how to do a thing? Um, versus that more, you know, traditional model where it may be a longer course or, a, you know, maybe even an instructor-led course. Um, also, as everyone else has, I'm sure we quickly moved into the virtual delivery space. Um, for Charter, we primarily use WebEx, so Cisco WebEx. Um, but we, I, the regional training teams, I have to say for all of you out there, like there was a huge lift on the part of our frontline training folk to take these complex technical modules and pivot them into WebEx and pull people into these virtual sessions and be able to bring their, their whole trainer selves into that space and make it an effective learning experience. Um, so really, while I'd like to tell you, Agnes, there was a lot of like, neat -o fancy technology on the back end, it was more about the human side supporting the technologies that we have and us connecting to each other as people and just figuring out how we make it work for our employees to get them the information they need to help our customers. If I can also add to that, what I was just really excited about, um, and some of you may know that AT&T is the parent company for Warner Media, but AT&T did something this summer that was just simply amazing for me. I've been studying massive open online courses for the last couple of years as part of my PhD program. And they actually delivered a MOOC this past June for students whose internships fell through. 
And they had roughly maybe about 50,000 students that enrolled. Ultimately, maybe around 11,000 students completed the actual 80 hour course. But what was amazing to me about what they did, they did this in a relatively short amount of time and, and, and they served a, a base that had no way to fulfill their internship agreements in some case for credit. And so when you look at where we are in this pandemic, I think it's an opportunity to reinvent, to you know, innovate in different ways. And like I believe Abby said, do some things that we've always wanted to do being in the technology space that we're in. And so I'm really excited about the things that are gonna now start to happen as a result of you know, the technology that's becoming more, more available and more proliferate across different industries um, and the opportunity that will present themselves. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because, you know, when we think about some of the emerging technology on the horizon, such as um, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, as well as AR, we don't necessarily associate it fully uh, with learning, but the power of these tools to customize learning paths and plans for at scale for our uh, constituents and learners, as well as really the number one thing we had to do in this pandemic is keep our people safe um, while still serving our customers. The power of that, I, I think, is, is tremendous. So thank you uh, for sharing that. I, I wanted to go back to something Abby just said. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, many people thought that it was all about, the acceleration was all about technology and the smart widgets and gadgets, but it was going mm -hmm. back to the basics, which was good communication and just being nimble. And I think Andy Parrott said that yesterday in another panel at, at Expo. Um, Rob, I know that you believe very strongly in communication and it's one of the things that Eastlink has leaned on tremendously during this time. Um, tell us how you leaned into communication as a way to accelerate and transform uh, your learning to meet the needs in this time. Well, I can't say I, we are, are fully there yet through our, our LMS. Uh, this most certainly has, uh, the pandemic has, has, um, has brought up a need to accelerate our, our LMS and, um, and our requirements within it. Um, we had uh, got uh, off of a, uh, an older LMS um, just a couple months before the whole pandemic hit. And uh, I would say um, when it did hit, things were expedited uh, greatly. Um, so we got to where we were uh, with, our, with our learning modules. And, you know, once we started sort of scratching away at, uh, at the LMS we were or using, um, you start seeing all these elements of social learning and what that can do for us. Um, so we are slowly um, chipping away at that. We have, we've dipped our toes in that water before um, with very basic share points and so on and so forth. But this most certainly has pushed us into an environment um, uh, sooner than we were expecting, but very much looking forward to what that can do for us. You know, I, I definitely also feel a byproduct of this time is that we are more willing to fail forward and fail fast with uh, hyper experimentation around um, things and, and knowing that not everything will stick. Um, so, you know, as, as you really reflect on this year and all of the changes that are continuing to happen, um, what, what are the key takeaways? Um, when you think about your organization's response, what, what went well? What did you do well that you think will carry forward? And perhaps in retrospect, what might you do differently? Uh, for myself, um, you start to see a, uh, an overlaying theme here and it's, I mean, it's, it's basic communication is what we did well. I, I think most of what, we did well came back to very basic things uh, such as encouraging conversations uh, from the techs in the fields to the operations managers as well as amongst themselves um, you know that we we had to move quickly with getting a a virtual service call and install going and uh, i know just a couple days before we were discussing back and forth is how could we you know, before the tool was available, how could we possibly 
uh, get to a point where this is going to be uh, safe for our technicians and, and serve our customers well uh, without entering a home. And at the time, it was simply getting back to where we were before automated phone calls. Um, it's uh, pick up the phone, get back to what we were doing, pick up the phone, uh, you know, uh, Encourage our technicians to call our customers before arriving to the job. Try some tr troubleshooting over the phone. So really, it was it was stepping backwards uh, in a lot of our processes. Uh, it also it promoted uh, further discussions around expectations during a service call or an install as well. Um, but you know, we we did we had to make sure that we were reach out to th the technicians in the field and sharing some of what they were observing in the field on a day-to-day -day basis. And we were constantly sharing not only the tips and tricks of what can make a virtual service call better um, but and more efficient, but as well as, as a lot of the customer feedback we were hearing nationally. So, and we were using that feedback on a day-to-day real-time basis. Uh, and that, of course, is not just my group, but uh, you know, everybody from IT finding the Virtual Connect tool, um, our marketing, uh, putting out um, information to our customers, our care teams, uh, every aspect of the company uh, came together there. Um, but again, using simple personal communication to just adjust our efforts. Um, it's, I think it's that type of engagement that really brought us together through it and, and uh, you know, maybe help that sense of not being so alone out there at times. But um, if I can give a, a quick example, our, our, our CEO has been putting out uh, uh, Friday communications to the company for, for years now, a simple email. And one of the emails during the time was, um, uh, you know, it was, it was a challenge. And the challenge was get a hold of one of your team members, uh, ask them how they're doing. And if they give you a one word answer, push. Push the conversation, drive the conversation. And I think, you know, it's, it's something I do with my seven-year-old son. He comes home from school, gives me the one-word answer, you know, how's school? Fine. Push a little more. And it certainly helped not only my team, but I think, you know, the way we communicate going forward as well. That is brilliant. Um, and, and it really speaks to the need for more human connection in these times where crisis and stress become that extra layer that could potentially pull us apart. Um, I, I love that one little nugget, um, push, don't accept one word. There's more behind that. Um, so I, I'm gonna pivot to, um, to uh, or punt to Abby and see if uh, there's anything unique that Charter did um, in retrospect that you think will stick. And, and if there's anything you in retrospect that your organization uh, would like to reevaluate as maybe something to put in the parking lot? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. And I loved what you said earlier, Agnes, about, um, you know, failing fast and then and recovering. And I think that that's definitely something, again, you know, the CEO panel, we heard a lot about that sort of entrepreneurial spirit and the innovation of our industry. And again, I think that our learning professionals and all of our organizations showed that. So I would say that really the two biggest things that stand out to me, I mean, clearly virtual delivery and, you know, not a surprise there, not just us, everybody, including, uh, you know, school systems, K through 12, college, et cetera, but really understanding how do you effectively deliver in the virtual space? Because as, as we've all been learning, it's not just as simple as like, oh, I already have a PowerPoint. Let me just share it on the screen and the magic will happen because it's, it's not that simple. It's a completely different type of experience for the learner. They're coming to it from a different place. They're not physically in the same room with one another. They don't have that human connection in the same kind of way. And you really have to design the course differently. So I think the biggest takeaway for all of us, not just Charter, is how do we reframe, rebuild, and intentionally design core content pieces where practical and possible to fit that virtual instructor-led synchronous environment? And then also, where do we take a step back to self-directed learning? And, you know, like Stacy was talking about, um, you know, it's, it's also partially about self-directed learning is about learners being able to self-select the areas in which they want to focus. It's not just building a scavenger hunt to teach them how to use an internal resource. It's about giving them that ownership 
and understanding that our learners are most successful when they experience a little bit of challenge in the learning space and they have an opportunity to, to guide it a little bit themselves because they're more connected to it. So I think the asynchronous virtual and the synchronous virtual are areas that are not gonna go away and that we have huge opportunities to really continue to enhance and bolster those offerings so that our learners get what they need out of those, those experiences. And then I think the other thing, again, Stacy mentioned this and, and Anthony mentioned this this morning too, is the social learning aspect. Rob, you mentioned this as well with your LMS. Um, but there's been some fascinating studies on the impact of social connections in learning. And especially uh, there's one that was done in 2018 that was specifically about web 2.0 technologies, which really just means like social media kind of stuff. So think about like discussion boards and that sort of thing. So it's what the findings are is that you can create a very real and compelling sense of community between learners who are remote from one another, if you effectively use the technology and you create a space wherein they can have that two-way discussion and dialogue and rich communication, just like we're doing in the conference this week, I would like to point out. Um, but you can do that. And it's back to what you said earlier, Agnes. It's about using the technology to enhance the human connection. They don't, they're not separate from one another. It's all interconnected. It's all intertwined. And the foundation of it all is how we connect with one another as humans. So I think those, those social learning, like communities of practice, discussion boards, all that kind of stuff is what we need to balance out the virtual delivery that is going to continue to happen. You know, I, I, I think you're speaking powerfully to the audience's uh, uh, quest to find out how do we do that? And I would imagine that we're still in the discovery phase of understanding how to do that effectively. Um, it's, it's not a, 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 a swing of a magic wand, if you will, um, and, and we're going to learn through uh, trial by five, if you will. But, but thank you for raising that. I think we're all going through a similar journey in that. Um, Stacey, I want to give you an opportunity to weigh in on this, and I know you have some thoughts around it as well. I, I really cannot do justice to what Rob and Abby already said. Um, for me, it's been really pleasing to see how um, Warner Media really uh, engaged employees through employee listening. And it was a ton more communication from our leaders. And, and, and I think that really set a precedent for, for me personally, for how I lead with others as well. And so I think the employee listening at this point, especially for learning leaders, is going to be really helpful so that uh, as you design your you know your learning strategy going forward you have that engagement and that buy-in and it's not a situation where you're putting something out and not understanding why you're not getting the engagement and so it goes back to what i was saying earlier about the co-creation i think we have a real opportunity as learning leaders at this point to really create something new and exciting for employees by partnering with them more closely on what, what it is that they need and how they want to consume it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that I know is on the audience's mind is the space that many of us play in that's on this panel and that, that's in the audience is really one that requires highly technical information to be synthesized. And, and for, for the operation space especially, it's very tactile. It requires a lot of lab-based, hands-on activity. How do you see uh, all of these changes in terms of takeaway really impacting our ability through learning, through the evolution of learning, to still meet the needs of those persons? You know, I would imagine that even our own personal learning is something we're thinking about, like how do we get that hands-on to touch, to feel it, to do the diagnostics with the tools to, you know, if we're not in the classroom. Any, any thoughts on that? Well, I, um, those of you who know me know I'm always looking for an opportunity to throw out a book recommendation. So I'm gonna throw out a book recommendation that, that goes along with this. It's called Facilitating Seven Ways of Learning. Um, it's awesome. It's super nerdy trainer stuff, but I highly recommend it if you're interested in learning more about the science behind what Agnes's question is, which is how do you link 
the way of learning or the, the modality of training to the desired outcome? Like, what are we trying to teach? What should the person be able to do at the end of the class? What's the transformed behavior or, or whatever, right? Because you are spot on, Agnes. There are certain things that are behavioral, meaning I have to learn how to physically do a thing. I can't learn how to do a D-ring carry or a shoulder carry on a ladder by watching Rob do it on a webcam. Rob is probably amazing at that, showing me on a webcam and explaining it. But I still have to have the physical feeling of doing it. So there is no easy answer other than there are certain things that in order to effectively transfer that information to the learner or have them be able to do the thing after the class that you may have to have a physical interaction. So I don't think that can really ever go away because that, like you said, there are things that like, you know, if I need to understand how to feel what it feels like to drill into a wall or something like I can imagine that all I like, but I'm never going to really be able to get it on that visceral level and be able to successfully do it unless I truly do it. Yeah, a lot to ponder right there. Um, and we will, again, continue to discover effective ways for, for, for doing that. Thanks for the book recommendation. It's called Facilitating Seven Ways of Learning. Uh, make sure that you put that on your book list. And speaking of putting it on your book list, why not go to the audience and see what questions might be in the chat. So if we could perhaps bring in Jill Banks at this moment, I'd like to hand it over to her to synthesize some of the questions that are coming in. Don't forget you can post your questions in the chat and uh, we will actually transition to that open immersive uh, uh, part of the session. Thanks, Agnes, and thanks, guys, to the panel. You guys are doing a phenomenal job, and your audience is very engaged. One of the themes that we're talking about are uh, that's standing out right immediately is about um, one: what's what? What is the magic formula uh, for the right amount of focused virtual learning on different delivery methods, such as lecture versus self-paced versus activities? in a given day. So who wants to jump in and answer that question first? Or do you want me to point it at someone? <laughs> Rob, you're right in front of me. Let's, why don't you try it first? Uh, I would, it, I, I think finding that, that, that formula, especially in this new environment is, is going to be a challenge for all of us. Um, I wish I could tell you right now off the top of my head what, what that is, what that should be. But for now, we, we are most certainly in, in a transition phase. It's one thing I, in my short time in, in training, um, you'll see it's always a pendulum. It's never static, that we are going from very basic um, ways of addressing uh, training um, through things like we were saying here, the overarching theme, through basic communication and, and, and rewinding. However, now at the other side of this um, transition, now we'll be looking uh, to something far far more advanced, um, like leaning on AI. Um, but I, I think what we do need to do is really um, engage the, the learners um, and, and their experience to tell us the way they would like uh, the training. It's not going to be the same, one size fits all. Um, and I think we do ourselves a disservice when we start to use the broad br brush when it comes to training. Um, it, it, certainly, um, it certainly would get us uh, into situations where we might be not engaging um, uh, a certain type of learner or uh, a certain uh, facet of, of the business, and we might be learning or uh, losing uh, something along the, um, in the communication line there. So again, going back to communicating with the, uh, with the learner and finding what it is that they need to be engaged, I think is our best bet. I would add on to that if I could and say that I think you're spot on, Rob, that it has to do with being learner-centered and learner-focused. Because if, if we as adult learning professionals shift our focus to exactly what Rob just talked about, the learner's experience, the learner's ability to receive new information, 
synthesize that into something new and do a thing. It's mm-hmm. all about behavioral change. If we're not paying really close attention to where they are and meeting them there, we're, it's going to be all about us. It's going to be about my lesson plan said, I give you two hours of this and one hour of that. Now, certainly we need to have some structure. That's not to say we shouldn't have structure, but if we shift collectively our focus to learner experience, we're always going to have a better outcome for that, um, that person, that human being who's attending that session with us. So stay right there, Abby, because I have a follow-up question for you as well. Abby brought up a great point when she said charter accelerated what uh, they were already planning for learning. How are you managing the setbacks and the challenges that come with accelerating your learning based on these new strategies? That is an awesome question. And I think all of us, because we are passionate about this industry, we know that feeling because that is the story of, of our industry in telecommunications and always has been, that we have the pedal to the metal all the time. We are moving forward quickly. We are changing quickly. And that means sometimes you need to course correct. So just in general, what I would say is it really comes down to, for all of us, as professionals and as people to have that, like lose a little bit of the discomfort about change because we have to be comfortable in that space because we know things are going to change. We're gonna try something and then it may not work and we have, to, we have to redirect and that's okay. But remember that every time we try something and we go, well, shoot, that didn't work the way I thought it was gonna work. <laughs> that's, that's cool, that's awesome. That's a learning opportunity, yes, yes. right? There's, there's some Thomas Edison quote about, you know, I learned how to make 10,000 wrong light bulbs or something. I'm not doing it justice, but the, the concept is there, which is that every time you get into that zone of discomfort and you try something and it doesn't work, that's still a good news story because now you know something that doesn't work. And we can go, all right, well, let's pivot and try something different. And that's an okay place to be. So I think what I would say, Jill, in response to that and, and everyone is don't be risk averse. Get out there, try it. What's the worst that's going to happen? We got to change directions. That's okay. Abby, you call those, what you call those are teachable moments. Everything is a teachable moment. And that's what you've just described. Um, I'm going to stay in that space and I'm going to stick to, I'm going to flip to Stacy. As we transition to more self-paced and virtual learning, what do you have in place to measure the success of these new methods of training? How are you showing the ROI in ways uh, more than just cost savings? That's a wonderful question. And recently I came up with a structure or framework, if you will, that allows employees to look at self-directed learning, collaborative learning, and then problem-based learning. Because I think that all learning, uh, what we strive in organizations is to, is to move people towards solving problems. And so putting this in a diagram or in a framework or a visual, if you will, that employees can see and understand, they realize that a lot of the self-directed learning they were doing was really the foundation of where we're trying to move them uh, from which is to collaborative learning, which is them sharing knowledge and then solving problems. And so I think you have to look at the structure of what it is that you're trying to do uh, to, to the question, you know, how are you measuring your outcomes? And then what does that look like? And so there, while there are a lot of different measures that we can use in learning and development, one of the ones that I've zoned in on recently is called return on expectation. Uh, and, the, and the reason why I zoned in on that, because I think that leaders have an expectation for what learners will do as a result of the investment. And sometimes it can be really challenging doing a one-to-one for the a dollar amount to say, how does that really impact the business? But when you look at the return on expectation, it says, what did I expect as a result of the investment in that training? And did we accomplish that? So for instance, we launched an ITIL Uh, training for our organization earlier this year. And a lot of people were able to consume that in different ways. Either they did it on an app, they did the in-person, the live uh, virtual training or however they deemed was best for them to learn. But at the end of the day, it was about people getting the certification for ITIL v4 that they intended to accomplish. And so the return on expectation in, in this particular case works. So I think you have to think about different ways of measurement that still provides a value to the business um, and not just the ROI, but maybe look at the ROE. 
Fantastic, fantastic answer. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Stacy. I'm staying with you. There's another question specifically for you in regards to the K through 12 learning transformation uh, that we were talking about a little while ago. What do you believe has been the most effective change that has been implemented? That's a great question. And it's really more personal than, than professional. And the reason why I say that is because my son is doing uh, virtual school like a lot of students right now. And what I've been able to observe is that his learning style and how he's been able to learn. And it's different when you put somebody in a virtual space than a physical space. And, and for me, it was interesting to see that he really kind of went farther than what he would have had he been, you know, in his classroom in a cohort style. So I think from a, from a virtual learning perspective, I think it, it really results in us taking some introspection into how we learn, what makes sense and finding ways to do that. And what's so amazing to me now is all of the virtual learning sites and information that has become readily available for that. So, so I think it's more about this at this point about introspection, really thinking about how best you learn and then, you know, how do you measure that progress for yourself? That okay. is fantastic, Stacey. Uh, Jill, I was wondering if before we go on to the next question, mm -hmm. you might be able to throttle back uh, to the previous discussion around return on expectation. I think that was a salient point that a lot of people are, um, are listening to and maybe taking notes around. And I know, Abby, uh, there's a, you, you're a bookworm and I love it. Um, and there's perhaps another book that you'd like to recommend as well as share a quote around that. Yes. Um, yeah, I will happily recommend books all day long. If you're ever looking for a book <laughs> recommendation, let me know. Um, so this is actually one, it, the book is called Informal Learning by Jay Cross. Totally awesome. So I mentioned earlier the informal learning space, which is that moment when I'm not in the classroom, I'm on the job, and I'm like, darn, how do I do that again? And I need to look that up. That's an informal learning moment. How do I change the brake pads on my car? Better find a YouTube video. That's informal learning, right? Um, and like Stacy said earlier, people are going and finding their own resources if we don't give them good informal learning resources. But one of the things that Jay Cross talks about is how do you measure that stuff? So it's uh, the return on expectation, which was beautiful, Stacey, I love that. Um, the return on investment. But the quote, I will read it off my wall so you get it exactly. The appropriate measure of learning is how good a job one is doing. Training metrics should be business metrics. So Jay Cross's whole point with that, and when he speaks about that in the chapter, is that so often in the world of training, we try to measure ourselves on things like how many people went to class, or what was their average test score? And like super interesting and useful information, don't get me wrong. But at the end of the day, to show that value to our business leaders, like Stacy was saying, sometimes their ability to see what was the impact that we made when we brought that person in or we gave them that learning experience, it can be hard to, to really tell that story. So to tell that story and advocate for ourselves, it's about business metrics. What is the business performance that is impacted by this learning experience? How do I drive the business forward by taking this person out of quota to attend a training class or asking them to look at this on their mobile device? And does that meet the expectations of the business and the leaders who are asking us to do that? And if I can just piggyback on that, I think where we should really move to is learning is part of the job. Um, and I, I think we're all in cultures right now where learning is seen as something separate, but it really is part of the work that, you know, it, it's um, it's important to the work. And so I think we have to move away from seeing it as a separate um, component that is what, you know, a choice. <laughs> it should be, I mean, to Abby's point, we do it informally anyway. So let's just really embrace it as part of the work and let's really create a learning culture. Yeah, that's spot on. Uh, and, and at Cox Communications, part of our target state learning roadmap is really advocating for what Gartner said which is really learning in the flow of work, which is exactly what you said. So um, spot on, could not have been say, said better. Uh, Jill, we're gonna punt it back to you for about five or six minutes for a couple more questions. Um, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I have a couple more here. Um, here's one. Um, 
Previous learner feedback typic, um, typically highlighted a consistent theme of requiring hands-on when the various products and services. How have your organizations managed through the need for hands-on training in a virtual environment? I know you guys touched on that a little bit um, during your conversation, but can you delve into it a little deeper? Hey, Rob, can you start us off with that? I was just about to push that over to Abby, actually, because we <laughs> have, we most certainly, uh, the, um, I guess in the last little while, um, we have launched a new product. Um, we were able to uh, to do a trial uh, basis here uh, in and amongst HRM, where we did get the the technicians to install that product in their home, and it's it's not something we do uh, on a larger scale. It is a very tough thing to navigate and manage. Um, I wish it were that easy every time. Um, to get that that type of uh, process rolling, but it, it, it is a very challenging thing to, to navigate. So really, um, we do see benefit uh, of it for sure. I wish I had the answer as to how we're gonna do it going forward. Um, as of actually just this morning, uh, we had we had another meeting about the uh, the possibility of launching another product in in one of our uh, one of our areas and and how we are going to manage that in a virtual classroom session without actually physically getting your hands on it. Um, it is most certainly, especially, uh, you know, uh, I was a technician at one point, um, and that taking that completely off the table, most of us do learn in a tactile format. We need to put our hands on things to, to, um, to really and truly understand it other than flipping through a deck and so on and so forth. Um, but as of yet, I haven't got all the answers. Uh, we, I think through these forums, through um, some of the discussions going forward, um, I hope um, that um, as a community, as professionals, we can work uh, somewhat together to to share ideas. Um, I know Abby, uh, I know does a lot of virtual classroom, and I'll be uh, ringing your bell soon. Um, but uh, m most certainly, it's uh, it is a challenge. We not only getting a, uh, a social culture built on on virtual learning. Um, and avoiding the distractions within that, but being able to uh, really uh, do a tactile type of uh, training going forward. It, it is a challenge. I most certainly haven't got all the answers yet. Well, I'm going to add on to what you just said, Rob, because it, it absolutely is a thing that for to learn certain types of skills, as I got excited about before, you need to have that hands-on experience for certain things. Mm -hmm. So one of the things... For, um, for some of the folks out there who may be on, you know who you are. There have been a couple of our areas who have done some really crazy, cool, innovative stuff to emulate that experience. And typically what it is, um, some areas have called it the smart hands model, which is uh, a model that you may be familiar with from a tech support perspective. Um, and it's similar to that in that the learners are at a location with a lab or a mini lab. There may or may not be other learners there with them, but the instructor is remote. And so that allows you to have a remote instructor who has something like a document camera potentially where they can show like up close on a shared screen what they're doing and the learners are back at their home location following along doing the same thing and they have a like a helper who's that you know smart hand maybe a supervisor or a lead or a senior technician. And so that is one way that we can overcome that and that's one that I like it, it's totally awesome. And I highly recommend that people kind of look into that because that's a way that in this weird interim period, we can still get to our learners with that physical, tactile, um, you know, kinesthetic experience and get the hands-on practice and still have the support of a training professional who really understands adult learning methods and processes and can get them where they need to go. Then I think the other piece of that, like Agnes, I said earlier, I wasn't going to talk about technology. Clearly, I was, I was. Uh, leading you astray. Um, but the other thing that I think we can do that um, our learning services team has been digging into is 3D modeling, which is not going to be a truly hands-on, but it's a great simulation and 
from a neuroscience perspective, you can kind of trick your brain a little bit that you actually are doing the thing. So building 3D models of equipment where the learner has an immersive experience that's uh, in a VR or AR environment, and they, you know, again, it's sort of tricking your brain a little bit. It's not truly a hands-on experience, but it's darn close. And depending on what you're trying to teach, you can still get the same learning outcome. I, I think that's that's uh, the AR side of it is most certainly going to be coming into play, whether uh, whether it's sooner or later. Um, I, I I had the privilege of getting a, a demonstration of it, and at the time, I you know you put the goggles on, and and of course they uh, they go through uh, uh, their demonstration. So you know, do you do you see this as being relative to to, to your field? It's well, if, absolutely, of course. Uh, it's the building of, of that type of environment, uh, that AR uh, uh, environment. It's most certainly going to have to, to come um, if we're going to stay in this situation for, well, uh, remains to be seen, I suppose. But. Um, Rob, absolutely. I would agree with you 100%. We and, and Abby as well, we're in that same space from an SET perspective and looking at those specific things as well. I want to try one last question, um, and it is going to go out to all of you. So if each one of you can just answer this as we go down the list, and I'll start with you, Rob, because you're right there in the forefront of me right now. What are some of the key initiatives or programs that you're that are being leveraged in your organizations to grow your internal talent talent pool? Uh, well. Um... Just recently, uh, we have um, our company has made a, a huge investment into getting certification um, for all of our technicians, um, and it's not to be taken lightly. There's not only optics of it. For from my perspective, uh, we were talking about return on investment, and I think Stacy, you nailed it there. But it's that it's investing. Um, not only in the technicians currently, but in our future technicians that are rolling in. Um, it, it is a major investment for time, of course, capital, so on and so forth. Uh, I, I feel very fortunate um, to work for a company that, that has taken that step and we most certainly have. Awesome, thanks. Abby. Yes. Excellent, excellent question. So uh, I think one one core piece that's something that Charter has had in place for quite some time is uh, we have progression programs. So an employee who is looking to move to the next level in their progression, say a field technician or a you know regional service center or whatever role they're in, they have a set um, curriculum that they can take certain courses and move to the next level if they meet certain other criteria. So that has actually been in place for a while. And we did a pretty awesome revamp of it in May of this year. Um, I would like to shout out to Jill and team for being a huge help with that process as well. Um, and our partners at NCTI as well. So we did a lot of work on that based on feedback from the learners. So we like to listen to what the learners have to say, as well as feedback from their leadership to really revisit the content and the coursework in those programs and make sure it's a very surgical, strategic um, set of courses that support their ongoing development. So that is like, that is the core core tenet of what we're trying to do with progressing people internally. Um, I would also add two other little things and, and then I'll pass it to Stacy. Um, we have a mentor program, which is currently in the process of being updated and enhanced for our aspiring leaders who may want to move into a leadership role and now in their individual contributor role, have an opportunity to coach and develop others when they come out of their onboarding courses, or if they're moving to a, you know, a next step up in their, um, in their line, uh, like as a field tech again, or a dispatcher. But that piece, that mentor program is a way that we can give that more hands-on support of those folks. And then we have some great leadership development programs, but I will leave those for later. Stacey, real quick, as we are closing, coming at the close of this session, if you can wrap it up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank really you. for us, it's about designing a skills assessment so that employees get that opportunity to, through artificial intelligence, understand their skills and gaps, and then designing a talent marketplace where we can then build that career mobility internally. Awesome, awesome. Our panel was awesome. 
Thank you very much. I am going to turn it back over to our moderator and she can bring us home. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jill, for facilitating that section. Uh, and we are really at times, so I wanna thank each of you. Stacy, Rob, Abby, phenomenal. I promised all of our audience that we are in for a treat and I hope you feel that way. We really should have a part two of this. And so we'll have to partner with SCTE to see how we can make it happen. Uh, just a quick reminder to wrap it up, a couple things and outcomes from this. Uh, remember communication and uh, constant communication, effective communication is crucial. Human connection during these times is critical as well. Uh, Anthony mentioned in his uh, keynote around executive support and engagement. And really that ties, that partnership ties to the ability to actually help the business to come along and understand what the return um, on expectation is, to use uh, Stacy's words. So um, just remember that as we continue to evolve learning, that we all are a part of it. And what stays the same is our ability to remain curious, to remain with a sense of wonder and to be always critical thinkers. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of Expo. Please join us at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our l and virtual happy hour. Take care. Thanks all.